During the lifetime of the surviving spouse, regardless to where the surviving spouse lives, the state is not allowed to recover. Also, the state has to delay recovery when there's a surviving child under 21 or a child who's blind or permanently disabled, regardless to where the child lives. Also, recovery is delayed in the case of a of a former home of the recipient when a sibling has lived in the home for at least one year immediately before the deceased Medicaid recipient was institutionalized and has lawfully resided in the home continuously since the date of the recipient's admission. Now note that the sibling does not have to have an equity interest in the home. Remember, the, the sibling had to have an equity interest in the home to permit um, an exemption of the property if it if you were looking at just a lien, just a lifetime lien. But now we're talking about a state recovery. So the sibling does not have to have an equity interest in the home. Um, and if the sibling is still living there in the home, Medicaid's going to hold off on a state recovery until that sibling no longer needs to live in the home. And in the case of a former home of the recipient, when an adult child has lived in the home for at least two years immediately prior to the deceased Medicaid recipient being institutionalized, who's lived there continuously since that time, and who can establish that he or, her, he or she provided care that may have delayed the recipient's admission to a nursing home or other medical institution. So the child's living there with the parent, and they suddenly need to go in a nursing home, they have lived there two years, provided care, kept them out of the nursing home, or they get home and community-based waiver services after those two years. After the parent dies, that home can actually be um, a place where the child continues to live and recovery will be delayed until they no longer need to live there. Now do realize that these conditions only delay a state recovery until all the exemption conditions are no longer present. Now, some states will waive a state recovery in these circumstances, but in Alabama, it will only be a delay. There is an undue hardship. A state recovery can be avoided if recovery would create an undue hardship, but I don't want to get your hopes up. Undue hardship is nearly impossible to prove, and it's a extremely narrow in Alabama. The agency will waive or delay recovery on a showing of undue hardship for purposes of the rule. It's defined as the existence of a situation established by convincing evidence that the estate subject to recovery is an asset such as a farm, family farm or family business which produces limited income. And that limited income is um, up to 141% of the federal poverty live level, which is roughly $1,596.82 a month this year. And it has to be the sole income producing asset of one or more heirs of the estate. Each heir with an interest in the recipient's estate must apply for a separate undue hardship. And if it's approved, that heir's interest in the estate will be exempt from recovery while any of the remaining heirs that did not apply for an undue hardship or were denied will still be subject to recovery. So eventually, somewhere down the road, Medicaid would be able to recover. I've given you a link to where you can apply for the undue hardship. Now, they have in the code two really strange things. An undue hardship is not available in the following circumstances. For recipients with long-term care insurance policies who became Medicaid eligible by virtue of disregarding assets because of payments made by a long-term care insurance policy or because of entitlement to receive benefits under a long-term care insurance policy. Medicaid tries to encourage people to get long-term care policies and they will give you an exemption of funds dollar for dollar if a long-term care policy paid for your care, you get to keep that money and you can still qualify for Medicaid when your long-term care insurance is used up. But bang, they get it on the other side. They can get it through a state recovery, those same funds. 
Another way that undue hardship is not available is if the agency determines that the hardship was created by the recipient by resorting to estate planning methods under which the recipient illegally divested assets in order to avoid estate recovery. And I have a note in here that in all honesty, I don't even know what Medicaid means by this, because if somebody has illegally divested assets, they've got a much bigger problem than estate recovery. Um, estate planning methods are generally implying legal divestment of assets. When you're doing estate planning, you, you're, you're not looking at, at illegally divesting anybody of their assets. Before 2019, Medicaid would just send a letter to the next of kin to say, you know, if there's anything left in the estate, we're due to be paid back. But in 2019, Alabama passed a law requiring the personal representative of an estate. I'll give you an example, John died in an accident and he was very young. He was very wealthy and he was healthy. But before probating his will or administering his estate, the personal representative of his estate would be required to send notice to Medicaid, even though they know he never drew any benefit. Um, I've given you a slide that shows you the notice requirements. There are a number of things that you have to provide to Medicaid to send it by certified mail. And you can see there's, and, and generally I will say that's something that your attorney is worried with doing when they're probating the estate. The notice has to be sent to Medicaid and by certified mail. And just as soon as you send it, you have to file something with the court, uh, like verifying for them that you did send it by certified mail. Medicaid has to respond back and they have to send it to the probate court and they have to do so within 30 days. They have to either file a claim, they have to file a waiver of claim, or they have to file a statement that no amount is due. And frankly, I have found that Medicaid is pretty um, responsive with these um, notices. It's not like ever, anybody's ever sitting around dragging their feet. It seems like they do respond pretty quickly. And I will tell you that apart from this notice required through probate, you can always call Medicaid and they'll tell you the amount of a lien, a state lien. Now, as practical consideration before you open an estate, it's important to determine any amount of benefit Medicaid's paid for a deceased person that's subject to estate recovery. Uh, if this information isn't known, chances are you can go and file for the probate and then you find out you have an insolvent estate. In other words, there's more debt than there is property. And that's gonna leave the people who file for the probate with nothing to get. In other words, they're basically working for Medicaid. Now, as an example, and this is an actual case that I had, Mary owned her home and lived there with her disabled adult daughter, Sue. Mary's will left the property to her two daughters, Sue and Dorothy. Mary went in the nursing home after age 55 and was awarded Medicaid. The home was excluded because Sue, her disabled daughter, continued living there. But after Mary died, a state recovery was delayed because Sue continued to live in the home. Not long after that, Sue died and the house had a value of $175,000 and Dorothy was ready to probate Mary's will to get the home into her name. The living daughter has now lost her mother, lost her sister, and she's ready to get the home put into her name. But Medicaid paid $240,000 for Mary's care. So there's absolutely no reason for Dorothy to probate Mary's will because the full value of the house will be payable to Medicaid from Mary's estate. I don't have to tell you that Dorothy was very disappointed to hear this and was just stunned and had absolutely no idea that that was gonna happen. Often family members are just not aware of the estate recovery and, um, so family members are often surprised and, you know, they'll, they'll basically take the value of the home through satisfaction of their relative's debt to Medicaid. 
And sometimes you see in these situations where family members just continue to occupy the property for years because Medicaid doesn't move to settle the estate, even though they have the power to do so. Um, and now if family members want to, they can negotiate with Medicaid if they want to purchase the property for less than the estate recovery claim. And a lot of families just abandon the property. That's all there is to it. After three months, Medicaid does have the right, after three months from the date of death, Medicaid has the right to file to have the estate administered in any county where the deceased owned property. And they can petition, but they have to get a third party administrator because the law prohibits the appointment of any employee of Medicaid as the administrator. Avoiding a state recovery. Medicaid eligibility requirements generally make it so that there's nothing left for a probate estate. I mean, it just doesn't happen that frequently. Any property a person owned uh, probably had to be sold when they applied and the assets spent down to 2000. So it's seldom that you see that for a single person. However, sometimes property will be left because it was excluded due to an intent to return home or due to a bona fide effort to sell it, and the person didn't return home, and they didn't sell it before they died. If money's left in a first party special needs trust, a special needs trust has to pay that back, and the agency can recoup money that way. Also, you all probably know that the agency is due to pay back any money left in a qualifying Medicaid qualifying income trust. Um, but note that if funds are recouped from an MQIT or a special needs trust, the estate recovery claim should be reduced by any amounts paid from those trusts with the balance of debt filed as a probate claim, if anything remains in the uh, probate estate. Estate recovery is more likely to occur in cases of married couples, and for this reason, it's important to plan for this and take action to try to limit it. Some ideas might be retitling the home to the community spouse so that it's not in the estate of the Medicaid recipient if the spouse dies first. And it's important that you do this before institutionalization. Note that there's no penalty to transfer that property from the institutionalized spouse to the spouse, uh, the community spouse. You can draft a new will for the community spouse, leaving only the marital share of the Medicaid to the Medicaid recipient, which amounts to $38,750, which you route from the estate from the, a separate bank account naming the community spouse's estate as the beneficiary or leaving it with no beneficiary so that it immediately falls into the community spouse's probate estate. This will permit the community spouse to satisfy the Medicaid uh, required marital claims against the estate and leave the home to the person of his or her choice. Um, because see, when your spouse dies, Medicaid requires you to get those spousal um, share of the estate of the spouse that died. You can have the community spouse change beneficiary designations from the Medicaid recipient to someone else and sell the property that would otherwise land in the Medicaid recipient's probate estate for the tax assessor's appraised value. Like I'm saying that the community spouse could go on and sell the property for the tax assessor's appraised value. Um, you still get notices from a contractor, the Medicaid contractor. They have an estate recovery contractor and they send out letters and um, it usually goes to the person that was named in the application as the sponsor. And uh, they say, you know, there is certain deadlines for you to apply for undue hardship and estate recovery delay. But whoever gets that letter should not send money without getting legal advice because it's important to determine what is and isn't in the probate estate and subject to recovery. For instance, joint accounts are not subject to estate recovery, but the person who gets the letter may not know that. The relative receiving the letter also, it's very important that they realize that they're not responsible for estate recovery. Only the probate estate of the former Medicaid recipient is responsible for the debt. And keep in mind that the estate recovery contractor 
um, can work on a contingency basis, meaning that the company's paid based on how much it recovers. So there's an incentive to lead the relative to believe that non-propate property may be recoverable or that there's some urgency to get um, this done. Be careful about out-of-state claims. Keep in mind that there may be claims from other states. Say somebody went into a nursing home in Mississippi and they stayed for a little while and then got transferred back into Alabama to another nursing home. You could actually have a state recovery claims from both states. If this is the case, it'll be necessary to get the opinion of an attorney in the other state. If there is any property that has escaped a state recovery in Alabama, unsatisfied debt from another state could cloud the title to the property in the future. In other words, when the personal representative is required to notify all known creditors, shouldn't he or she know that um, Medicaid is a creditor in another state, or it may be, in fact, a creditor. And at least, I think that the probate attorney should know this. Be sure to get advice if you're in doubt concerning the applicability of a state recovery when a Medicaid recipient dies. Okay, now that concludes our presentation. And what I'm going to do is give you, I, I enjoy this part because I'm, I'm hoping to find out that you did learn something from the presentation. This is a little test just for yourself. Nobody's going to see your answers. This is just so you can monitor how much you understand about Medicaid estate recovery. Um, so let's look at this. Mary, age 69, is an Alabama Medicaid recipient, and she owns a bank account that's titled to her and her son. She goes in a nurse draws benefits for three years. When she dies, can Medicaid claim an interest in that account? So just put down your answer. And um, I'll give you just a minute to make up your mind. Okay, the answer to that is no. The reason that they cannot claim against that is because there's a joint owner in the account. That isn't going to go into Mary's probate estate. Now, Linda, 73, receives SSI. She lives in a home she owns. When she dies, can Medicaid claim the value of her home? What do you think? The answer to that is yes. Remember, Alabama decided to go after people who were on SSI, who have Medicaid. This would fall into her probate estate and Medicaid would have an estate claim there. Now, Edward, 79, lives in his home with a daughter who moved in and provided him a great deal of care for five years to keep him at home. He applies for home and community-based waiver. Can Medicaid force a sale of the home when he dies, leaving the daughter without a place to live? What do you think? The answer is no. They can only delay recovery but she would be protected to continue to live in that home because she's the caregiver child who provided care for over two years and kept him from having to have home and community-based waiver services or go into a nursing home. Now, John, age 82, owns a home where his son, a disabled vet, lives with him. John enters a nursing home and is approved for Medicaid. The home has a tax assessor's appraised value of $125,000. Medicaid paid $376,000 for John's care. When John dies, will Medicaid drop any claim to John's house since his disabled son lives there? What do you think? The answer to that is no. Medicaid will delay recovery and protect the disabled son's ability to live in the home, but they will not drop any claim. They will continue to have a claim by delaying a state recovery. Cynthia, 68, applies for QMB and is awarded. 
She owns her home. She receives benefits for eight years. When she dies, can Medicaid expect to be repaid from her estate? Now, I'm really hoping everybody knows the answer to this. And the answer is no, because QMB is an exception to estate recovery. And then Sue, age 75, and Tim, age 77, own property as joint tenants with right of survivorship. Tim enters a nursing home and is awarded Medicaid. Then Sue dies. Will Medicaid have any interest in the home? What do you think? Yes, Tim will have to sell the home because it's joint tenants with right of survivorship. The home will immediately belong to Tim at the moment Sue dies. And what will happen is, I guess he could give a lien to Medicaid and put it on the market and try to aim for the bona fide effort to sell exclusion of the property so that he continues to get benefits. But when the home sells, Medicaid's lien would be paid off. And if anything else is remaining, he would fall off Medicaid until he's spent down to $2,000. Now, our last question is Philip, age 53, enters a nursing home and owns property with his wife, Carol, who's 56, as joint tenants with outright of survivorship. He draws benefits for a year and dies. Will Medicaid have any interest in his share of the home after Carol sells the property or dies? What do you think? No, there will be no Medicaid estate recovery here because Philip isn't age 55. He never drew benefits after age 55. And there was no lien already given on that property or anything of that nature. So given that scenario, um, there wouldn't be any Medicaid estate recovery. Okay, that concludes our little test. And if you don't feel comfortable with your answers or feel like you didn't um, get it, be sure and download this presentation so that you can um, get a little more comfortable with how Medicaid estate recovery works. And if anybody has any questions and you want to reach out to me directly, feel free to do so. And with that, I'm turning it back over to you, LaToya. Just be sure, and thank you so much, Ms. Jan Neal. Um, that was some great information about the Medicaid um, estate recovery process. I do know working, uh, when I was working as a case manager, uh, those questions came up a lot, especially with people receiving, and even with uh, the Medicare, especially with people receiving different, um, you know, assistance from Medicaid with the Medicare stuff, QMB and um, LIS programs and things like that. So thank you so much, some good information there. Um, don't forget, you guys, uh, be sure to submit your evaluations um, at 24 hours after this class, and just be sure to put all the correct information on there uh, as you have recorded with the licensing board, and be sure to send your evaluations to humanresourceoptions.com. Well, thank you, everybody, again. Thank you again, Ms. Carlett, and thank you again, Maria. And uh, you guys have a good rest of your morning.